Well, all right. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Judges. Now, it's been a, a little while since we've been in Judges, so let's kind of remind ourselves where we're at in all of this. As we come to Judges chapter 8, um, you, you remember that Israel was, uh, they were facing an existential threat. I mean, their, their national uh, survival was really on the line. They, they were living in some very narrow margins. They had this people group that came out of what we would know today as Northwest Saudi Arabia. They were, they were called the Midianites. They came out of that region of the world. And they would come out during the time of the harvest. And they would come with these large numbers. It was a blitzkrieg. They were the first people that we know of in history that had militarized the camel. And so they would come with just great swiftness out of nowhere. And they would come in, they would take, they would steal everything that would meet their needs and the people that they left back home. And then they would destroy the rest. So here is Israel really living kind of on the verge of starvation, if you will. And this has been going on for seven years. Of course, the Lord is allowing all of this to go on to get the attention of his people. His people had turned their back on him. His people had lived in unfaithful ways to him, caught up in idolatry and these kinds of things. And so the Lord gives space, gives way for the Midianites to come in and allows it to continue now for seven years. Now, they then come in with 135,000 guys. It was the time of the harvest, and just like clockwork, uh, here they come. And the Lord, you remember, uh, spoke to a very humble guy uh, by the name of Gideon. And Gideon uh, didn't have a real high a view of himself. The Lord called him, and, and you remember the Lord said, hey, mighty man of valor, and you remember he's hiding out, and he's like, you got the wrong address, right? You got the wrong guy. And you remember he said, look, I come from, you know, a nobody, fa I am a nobody in a nobody family. I mean, you obviously got the wrong guy. But the Lord, you remember, uh, brought about several convincing proofs that look, you, you're just the guy I'm looking for, and, and, and I'm going to use you in an incredible way. And so you remember that Gideon, he sent out the call, hey, who wants to help me take on these Midianites? And you remember, 32,000 guys show up. That's, that's pretty good, right? I mean, that's a good size group of guys, but... They're still going up against 132,000, 135,000 uh, Midianites. So you're, you're still talking about four to one odds. Those aren't great odds. But you remember that the Lord said to Gideon, I know these people. I know how they're wired. And I know if I give them victory with 32,000 guys, they're going to take credit for me. Uh, and they're going to take my credit. And even though I'm blessing them, even though I'm doing the work, they're going to take the credit. So you got to get rid of some of these guys. And you remember that the Lord pairs it down to just 300 guys. 300 against 135,000. Those are not <laughs> wonderful odds, are they? But you remember that the plan was they went in in the middle of the night with just pitchers and torches. And of course, it was right after the second watch. We're talking about just a little after 10 o'clock at night. And so in that darkness, obviously the Midianites would believe that anybody that would be foolish enough to attack them must be coming with superior numbers. And of course, you can't see the hand in front of your face. And so these guys start killing each other. The camp is in total disarray. And so they start heading back home uh, as many as could get out of there, uh, you know, taking care of their own skin. And so they start heading to the southeast, you remember. Now, Gideon... He comes down, he's on the western side of the Jordan River, and around the off-ramp to go over to Succoth, it would appear that the Midianites had divided their forces. And some of the forces went down to Beth Bara in that direction, and other forces crossed over the Jordan River, and they headed towards the region of uh, Succoth. Now, it's important that we understand 
that the battle is still raging. It's very, there's some important lessons for us to learn here in chapter 8, but we really have to understand the context of the story that we're reading here in chapter 8, that the battle is still raging. Understand that we're just hours into this battle, right? It's not like he has victory and now these events take place after the war. No, the war is still going on. The killing is still taking place. The shooting is still going on. Now, you remember that he then sent out to the tribe of Ephraim, and, and Beth Barah would be in that region of Ephraim. And we, we ended uh, with this verse and a couple of others. Then Gideon, he sent messengers throughout all of the mountains of Ephraim, uh, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as uh, Beth Bara and uh, all the way to the Jordan, all right? So the context is, is that now uh, that they are in what we would think of as cleaning up, mopping up operations, he sends a call uh, to the major tribe in that region, uh, Ephraim, and says, hey, you got guys going down in your territory, and uh, so why don't you take care of them? And then he decides that he's going to head over and follow the force that crossed over the Jordan, and he's going to go to the town of Succoth. So the context is he and the 300 guys, they have brought about incredible disruption to the Midianite camp, and they're killing themselves. It was under the cover of dark. And now they're running home just as fast as they can. And so for whatever reason, he wants to keep the 300 guys with him. And he's going to chase after those guys that had crossed over the Jordan. And now on the west side of the Jordan, uh, this is where the tribe of Ephraim is taking care of whatever contingency of the Midianites had gone south. So the battle's still raging. Right? So this is, this is important for us to see. Now notice what happens in uh, verse 1. Now, the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight the Midianites and they reprimanded him uh, sharply? Now, two kinds of people. All right? There are people who get things done, and then there are people who criticize people who get things done, right? And, you know, they have now taken offense that somehow uh, they were not called sooner. Now, keep in mind, you got 135,000 enemy that's really just on your northern border. I mean, I would think if you're really that anxious to get involved with a fight, you would have known about 135,000 and you would have done something uh, by now. Now, notice that these guys are upset with Gideon because Gideon hasn't called them. Now, he put the call out, 32,000 guys showed up. Maybe they wanted a, a personal invitation. I don't know, but they're deeply offended. Now, what we have to remember is that Gideon has done nothing wrong. Gideon has obeyed God to the letter. God made it very clear. I know you people. I know you'll take credit. I know that you won't worship me. You won't glorify me unless I make the odds ridiculous. And so let's try these odds. 300 against 135,000. I only want 300 to go into battle. And so what Gideon uh, should have said is that, look, I was obeying God, and I'm sorry that you're offended, but to be honest with you, uh, you just weren't invited, all right? Uh, you, you are believing that you're called to something that God uh, has not called you to. Now again, get the context. They, the battle just started 10 o'clock last night, all right? And here it is the next day afternoon. You're still fighting. The war's going on. And I'm sure that Gideon expected to get pushback from the Midianites, but what we so often don't expect 
is when we get pushback from our brothers and sisters, when we get pushback from our fellow followers uh, of the Lord. Now, there's a great lesson here for, for us to learn. I am telling you, it has been my experience, and I have been at this a long time, that this is one of the most difficult situations to deal with. There are going to be people who have a, a sense that they are called uh, to some big thing. There are going to be those people uh, that believe uh, that their name should be in lights and that uh, they are uh, great and wonderful and they have not as yet experienced greatness. And the reason why they haven't experienced greatness is because of you. You're standing in their way. You somehow have made certain decisions that have affected them and is holding them back from really realizing this grand thing that God wants to do in their life. And if the Lord uses you to be... Um, a team leader in a ministry, or there's some ministry that you're involved in to, to some degree in leadership, or you're a pastor, an elder, you're involved in some other kind of ministry where you've got to make um, administrative kinds of, of decisions, that there are going to be people who have a sense that they're called, but, but they're not called. And it's clear that they're really not, it's clear that they think of themselves as being greater than what they are. And if somehow you would just get out of the way and give them the stage, while we what they couldn't accomplish uh, for uh, the glory of God. And this is the Ephraimites. And so the Ephraimites show up and they are jumping ugly with Gideon, you. You, I mean, we could have been uh, awarded the most valuable player here in this war uh, if it wasn't for you. Now, Gideon uh, could have spoken to them truthfully, but as we're going to see here in just a moment, uh, he does not. Now, notice that we're told here that they reprimanded him. Now, that word reprimand is a very strong word in the Hebrew. It's a word that Nehemiah used in Nehemiah 13 when he had a problem with a group of guys. He said, I contended. That word contended is a word here, reprimanded, with them. I cursed them. I smote them. And I plucked off their hair. I mean, this was a knockdown, drag out confrontation. And this is the wording now that is used for Ephraim. I mean, they lit that boy up. Why did you call that? You're trying to keep all the glory to yourself and all of this. Now, we find Gideon, he's a humble guy. And Gideon decides that he's going to respond with the counsel of Solomon. Solomon said, a soft answer turns away wrath. And he decides in verse 2 that he's going to become very diplomatic here uh, in his uh, approach. He's not going to be truthful, right? The truthful thing to say would, dude, you're not called, all right? I'm telling you, God told me only 300 guys were to be used in, you know, this initial uh, conflict that happened at the camp of the Midianites. You're not called. You think you're called, but you're not called. That would have been the truthful thing to say. But Gideon is a gracious guy. And Gideon says to them in verse 2 that, I mean, come on, guys. I mean, what am I? I mean, you're getting all upset with me, but really? I mean, look at you guys. You guys are great you guys are awesome. I mean, how in the world do I compare to you guys? I mean, what are you getting all upset about? Look at how wonderful you people are, right? And then notice in verse 3, God has delivered into your hand the princes of the Midianites, Orb and Zeb. You know, these two rednecks that we talked about last time we were together. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? 
And then their anger toward him was subsided uh, when he uh, said that, right? I mean, come on, guys. Would we? we just attacked him. Right, that's all we did. We just started the fight. But oh, look at you guys. You took down two of their kings for crying out loud. You ought to be really pleased with how the Lord has, has used you. And, and so he's kind of kissing up to him here, I think, uh, a little bit. And uh, so he just responds with this, this soft answer, this very uh, diplomatic way. And so they're kind of soothed with, uh, with all of this. Now, there is something about the Ephraimites. Now, the Ephraimites, they were kind of a tribe of Barney Fives, right? They were, they were a group of guys that just thought they were something, right? They had a very high opinion of themselves. Now, they're going to try this. A little bit later on, we're going to get to it in the weeks ahead, with a judge by the name of Jephthah. Now, Jephthah is a very different cat than Gideon. And Jephthah is not going to put up with their garbage at all. And they are going uh, to regret the day that they tried to pull this on somebody who wasn't a gracious, humble guy uh, like Gideon. Now look, there were lessons that the, that the Ephraimites needed to learn. There are lessons that you need to learn, and lessons that I need to learn. And the Lord wants to teach us these lessons graciously. But if we refuse to learn these lessons uh, by a Gideon in our life, well, the Lord will most certainly bring a Jephthah in our life that we might learn that same lesson under a harsher uh, teacher, if you will. The Lord's going to teach us lessons. And again, you can learn those lessons either the easy way or you can learn them the hard way. And so here was an opportunity for the Ephraimites to understand some very, learn some very important lessons Instead of doing that, they don't learn the lessons, which means they're just going to have to come right back to this same classroom in the future, and they're going to get their rear ends kicked because they wouldn't learn uh, that lesson. And so, so we then see that, that here, here Gideon, he crosses over uh, the Jordan, and he comes to uh, Succoth. All right? Now, again, you got to understand the context of it. These guys, they're involved in hand-to-hand combat, um, for a number of hours now. Their blood sugar is, is dropping, right? I, I mean, you know what it's like to try and exercise when your blood sugar uh, drops. Uh, um, imagine the stress that, that they're under. You know, we can read this and not understand the pressure that these guys were You know, in, in today's conflicts, the violence happens a little ways from you. Now, maybe you're going house to house, you're trying to secure a place, maybe you might get into some very up-close and personal violence, but for the most part, much of the violence that happens to today's soldier, it, it happens a little ways away. I mean, we're using bombs and guns, for crying out loud. But understand that in this era, the violence was right at the end of your arm. And so here are 300 guys, no doubt covered in blood, sweat, and, and dirt. Uh, they have been at this now for a number of hours. They're beginning now to, to have that blood sugar drop down, no doubt very shaky, no doubt very weak. And so Gideon comes to the guys at Succoth, right, this town uh, that's got supplies that they can uh, take advantage of. Now notice in verse 5 that he then said to the men of Succoth, now please give loaves of bread. I mean, that's what you want. You want bread, you know, you want pasta, right? You want to carb up here for the next phase of the, of the run. Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me. Notice he's not even asking for himself. He's not being selfish in any way. They're there, there's nothing going on here that's in it for him, right? I got these, I'm worried about these guys, right? We, we've got more fighting uh, to go on here. And so please give us uh, bread for the people that follow me for, reason word here, they are exhausted. And I am pursuing Zeba and Salmuna, the kings 
of the Midianites. Now notice, even under the stress, the stress of war here, notice that he's being very polite, please, right? He doesn't go in and hold a sword to anybody's neck. He's, he's being very decent here. Hey, now, it would, it would seem appropriate because the men of Succoth, they were Jews, and they had no doubt suffered just like the rest of the Jews had. And so when he says, I'm chasing the kings of the Midianites, I mean, these are your enemies too. I'm, I'm going after guys that had taken advantage of you in past uh, years. So it seems to me like this was a, a very uh, reasonable request. Nothing unreasonable is, is going on here. And, uh, and so these men of Succoth, they, they were like uh, many of the men and women that we vote into office. There are many people who run for office and they run under the guise that they're pro-family, they run under the guise that they are pro-life, and then when they get into positions of power and they begin to look at some of the legislation that would be pro-life or pro-family, uh, they bail, right? And many of these men and women they have no core values. They have no core convictions. All they are interested in is surviving. They're not interested in what is right and wrong. And so a, a, a piece of legislation comes across their desk that is uh, something that stands up for traditional marriage. They all of a sudden fold. And they think to themselves, if I vote for this legislation, then maybe this corporation over here, they're not going to donate to my re-election campaign. And even though it's the right thing to do, I'm not going to do it because what I'm more interested in, rather than being right or wrong, what I'm more interested in is surviving and being elected into office again. And so the men of Succoth, they say to Gideon, hey, it seems to us that you don't have the hands of those kings yet. Yeah, those kings, they went over that hill. Now what happens, you go over that hill, and then a few hours later, they come back over the hill because they've killed you. And they're going to do a little bit of investigation to find out who in the world has been helping Gideon. And when they find out that we were the ones that helped Gideon, well, they're going to wipe us out. Now, they're not interested in doing what's right. They're playing it safe. And they're trying to keep themselves in a uh, place of surviving, right? So they've got these two warring factions, and rather than taking a stand with what is right, they simply, in fact, we're going to see here in just a moment, uh, that they, um, they actually make fun uh, of Gideon here. And, uh, and so uh, Gideon uh, says, all right, well, whatever. Uh, let me tell you something. God is going to give me victory and when God gives me victory, I'm going to come back here, and uh, you guys are going to be uh, sorry uh, for what I end up uh, doing to you guys. And uh, so then, uh, notice that uh, he ends up going over to um, uh, Penuel, and uh, Penuel uh, gives him basically uh, the same response. We're not going to help you. And they had some kind of a tower. They had some kind of a defense mechanism in their town. And uh, Gideon says, uh, God is going to give me victory, and when I come back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock down your tower. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And boy, you're going to be sorry. And so then uh, he goes over the hill and he catches up uh, with these guys and he captures, notice he captures these uh, two kings. He, get, he gets both Zeba and uh, Zalmunna and he completely uh, decimates uh, the entire army. All right. And God gave him victory. And so he heads back now uh, to uh, Succoth. And uh, he's, Gideon's a reasonable guy. He gathers some intelligence, and he finds out who the elders of Succoth is. He, know, he knows not everybody's guilty. The whole town's not guilty, but the leaders are guilty, right? And I want to take care of the leaders. And so he's taking names. He's writing their names down. And notice in verse 15, then he came to the men of Succoth, and he said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom, notice, you 
ridiculed me, right? They ever say, oh, you're counting your chickens before the eggs are hatched, boy. I don't, I don't think I want to put my money on you. I don't think you got a chance against them. And, uh, you know, you go fight them and they win and then we're going to be in big trouble. And so you ridiculed me saying, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took of the elders of the city, <laughs> I love this, thorns of the wilderness and briars. And with them, notice, I love the new King James here, he taught uh, the men of uh, uh, Succoth, right? And uh, suffering uh, is a, a great teacher. And so he takes these elders, he takes these guys that wouldn't help, they're really endangered, uh, his small army, and he beat them with briars, beat them with sticker bushes, I, I suppose here. And, uh, and they learned, he taught them uh, that way. If, look, if you bet against God, uh, you are uh, going to lose, and God is going to do uh, exactly what he said uh, that he was going to do, and we're going to suffer, and we will learn our lessons uh, the, the hard way. And then he, he heads over, notice, over to Penuel, and uh, sure enough, keeps his word, tears down their tower. Now they've got to build the dumb thing uh, up again. And uh, now, here, here's the amazing thing. They have witnessed the supernatural working of God, Israel. They have witnessed an obvious miracle of God. The Midianites are now defeated, and happy days are here again. And notice what these people do in verse 22. And then the men of Israel, they said to Gideon, rule over us. Now, notice they want this to be a multi-generational thing. Notice they want this to be kind of a dynasty that they're establishing here. Rule over us, both you, your son, and your grandson also. So we want this Gideon rule to go on for a while. And notice what they say here. For you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. You know, we are just so helpless, aren't we, when it comes to wanting some visible representation of God in our life. How many people look for a human instrument to give them some kind of comfort that God is in their life and God is working uh, on, on their uh, behalf. Here, God, God said, I know the heart of these people. And I know that if I give you victory with 32,000, somehow you're going to credit the human aspect of all of this. And so God makes this so utterly ridiculous and still, they are still praising men. They're still placing their trust in men. We want to make you king over us because you're the one uh, that has uh, given us victory. The business of any leader among God's people is to direct their attention to the fact that it is God who gives the victory. It is God who is their answer. It is God who is their savior. And we need to get our eyes off of uh, human instruments, um, if you will. And so he then, now here's the interesting thing. You'll notice that dark clouds are beginning now to gather around Gideon. Gideon does not finish well. And this needs to be a concern of all of us, that as we age, it is far more important that we are flaky early on in our Christian experience. And as we grow older in the Lord, we become more diligent, more committed, more trustworthy in our faith. You don't want to flake out in the final days of your life. That's what's going to be remembered. 
What you want people to say at your funeral, the guy was a flake 30 years ago. I'm telling you, boy, didn't he really get his act together? And wasn't he something in those days leading up to his death? And yet, how many times do we see in Scripture guys who brought forth tremendous fruit of faith yet they flake out in the end. Now Gideon says to these guys that want to make him king. Now I'm not going to be your king, right? I don't need the headaches of being king. But you can't give me gold. I will uh, take gold. And uh, they give him uh, quite a bit of gold here. And, uh, and he, notice uh, King James says that he made an ephod. He made a breastplate. Now, it's really hard to figure out what in the world is going on with this guy. And he sets it up in his hometown. And we read there that Israel began to worship it. It became uh, an idol. Now Spurgeon makes this insight here. He says he did not set up an idol, but he made an ephod, an imitation of that wonderful vestment that's worn by the high priest. Perhaps he made it of solid gold, not to be worn, but to be looked at, simply to remind the people of the worship of God and not to be, uh, not to be its self-worship. But dear friends, You see here that if we go a half inch beyond what God's word warrants, we always uh, get into uh, mischief, right? And and so, um, you know, I I think that we have to understand that this is a guy now, he has become um, wildly popular, so popular that the people want to make him king. He has become quite wealthy, and, and you'll notice then uh, that he began uh, to multiply wives, right? Uh, this guy uh, has, um, he's got a, a, a real uh, sexual addic- addiction uh, going on in his life. Notice he has 70 sons, right? 70 sons. Well, how, many, how many girls is that? And notice that we're told there that he was able to have all of these children uh, because he had uh, many uh, wives, right? Pride, money, and women, Uh, These are the three snares uh, that God will use in any uh, man's life. Um, You remember Dick uh, Morris. He was the guy who had really saved uh, the Clinton presidency. uh, And he's the one that really rehabilitated President uh, Clinton. But you remember uh, that Dick Morris, that he... uh, he had his own demons, and, and he got really weird, you remember. And in, a, in an interview, he says, my sense of reality was, was just altered. I started out being excited working for the president, and then I became arrogant. Then I became grandiose, and then I became self-destructive. Man, everybody who turns 40 should read the Greek tragedies. They all have within them the same idea that the thing that may have helped you move up then destroys you. And I am a living example of that. Success is just hard to handle. You ever have a friend that suddenly becomes wealthy? You ever have a friend that suddenly becomes powerful? I'm telling you, it is easy for you and I to get a distorted view of ourselves, And no doubt uh, this was going on in Gideon's life. Now Gideon, he ends up, of course, being in the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He was a man of faith. Right? I fully expect that we're going to see Gideon, but how wonderful his life might have been had he not allowed pride and money and women to distort everything. Well, then notice verse 33 then as we uh, close out. Again, Israel, it is the same sad story, isn't it? Notice verse 33. And so it was that as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel played again the harlot. That is, spiritually, they were unfaithful. They were practicing spiritual prostitution. God wanted them to be his only lover, and now his only lover is making love 
with other gods, so to speak, spiritual harlotry. Notice with the Baals, and notice that they made Baal bareth their God. Now, to make matters worth, worse, Baal bareth means the Lord of the covenant. Now, the God of Israel was the Lord of the covenant. The God of Israel was the one that had an agreement with them. It was the God of Israel that had proven his love and called them as a nation and had eternal plans uh, for them. And now uh, they give it to this God and they were committed. How committed were they to this God? The Lord in Jeremiah uh, chapter 19 tells us, and they built worship sites to burn their children as sacrifices to Baal. I didn't ask them uh, or command them to do this. It never entered my mind. You see, the problem with Israel, and this is a problem that is repeated in every generation of the church, the problem with Israel is that they did not develop a personal and meaningful relationship with their creator. There wasn't that personal devotion. You see, just give me a guy. Just give me a guy and let him tell me what I need to do. I'll check it off of my list and then I will get on with the rest of my day. And you see this over and over again where people, they have a religion, they have a relationship with a religion. They have a relationship with a religious organization. And because they don't have a deep and meaningful personal relationship, they don't have a real relationship they they go to church they check off the box they you know they pray around a circle of beads they burn a few candles they do whatever they have to do check it off their list and they get on with the rest of the day that is not a faith that's going to change your life that is not a faith that's going to sustain you in difficult times it's not a faith that's going to see you through dark hours of your life what is going to keep you faithful and what's going to keep you Square with the Lord is when there is the reality of I know God. I have a relationship with God. Too many people have a relationship with a 501c3. Too many people have a relationship with a priest or a pastor or a whatever. Um, a very interesting book called um, Reformation Revisited by Greg Ogden. He, he tells us this. The chief reason why the dependency model of ministry, and the dependency model of ministry is where everybody needs a spiritual covering. Everybody needs a uh, spiritual authority in their life that can tell you the will of God, tell you when to jump, tell you how high to jump, tell you what the will of God is. You are dependent upon another human being. You are to be dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one great high priest, Christ. He is the one that you seek for direction and purpose in your life. Now, anything else is creating dependency upon a weakened model. The reason why dependency model of ministry still dominate is that many pastors' sense of worthy and value is derived from being a benevolent Lord reigning over a little fiefdom. From a psychological view, we would be appalled at parents who uh, assert their authority in keeping their children dependent upon them even though they are adults. Yet. We do not evidence the same disgust at anemic churches made up of uh, perennial spiritual children who are not allowed by their parent pastors to grow up. Underlining the dependency model of ministry is a distorted and unhealthy means of seeking value. Pastor and people are co-conspirators denying the addiction and fostering the sickness. God wants you to draw near to him. And if you will draw near to him, he will draw near unto you. He will lead and guide. He will give you purpose and direction for your life. You, there is only one mediator 
between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a priest. It's not an elder. It's not a religious organization. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are to finish out your walk of faith strong, if you are to finish strong, it takes a genuine personal relationship with your creator. And he offers it. Thank goodness. He offers it to you and I by his great and glorious grace. And so I think that as we uh, go to prayer tonight, uh, we need to be praying, Lord, help me to be genuine in my faith. Help me to cultivate a personal relationship with you. And Father, we do ask that as we leave here that, Father, would you do that very personal work in each of our hearts? Lord, I would ask that if I have a brother or sister here this evening, they're just kind of drifting a little bit. They're just kind of cooling uh, in their passion for you. Father, as we live in these uncertain days, it takes a genuine faith uh, to stand strong. And so, Father, I pray uh, that we would continue to be amazed that you want to have something to do with the likes of us. I thank you, Father, that you're interested in me. I, I thank you, Father, that, that, Lord, here we are, just ordinary people, and, and we're weak people, we're frail people, we're inconsistent people, we're, we're people with issues, Lord, and yet, Lord, you love us. And, and so, Lord, may we take full advantage of the grace that is ours in the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may we never cease to be amazed at your grand and glorious love. Father, help us, each and every one of us here, to draw near to you and then to witness you drawing near to us. Use our lives, be glorified in and through us, Father, for we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.